How does that happen? Page 80 of Root, Orient, and Weed, it says, the locking mechanism is parallelism between the lo long axes of the two articulations of the mid-tarsal joint. That parallelism between these two axes causes motion to occur, and obliquity stops motion. That didn't make a lot of sense to me because the talonavicular joint is an ovoid ball and socket, meaning it has an infinite number of axes. So whatever the axis is going to be here, it will find a parallel axis here. So I started looking at what is the locking mechanism. And what it turned out to be is that when the foot goes into adequate supination where the anterior facet is level, then the talus can externally rotate on the anterior facet. What's trying to externally rotate it? What happens is the stance phase leg is in front of the trunk of the body. As you're passing the stance phase leg, the trunk of the body passes and externally rotates the thigh, which externally rotates the tibia and attempts to externally rotate the talus. But that can only occur when, you're in, when you have a level anterior facet, when you're in adequate supination. Then the external rotation does occur, and once it occurs, it blocks sagittal plane motion between these two bones. When you pull up on the gastroc, you can't rotate around the subtalar joint, you have to rotate around the ankle axis and propel forward. So basically, goal two is to have a propulsive lever by having adequate resupination by mid-stance. Third problem. Coming over an unlocked foot, the first metatarsal is free to move on its axis. It moves up and out to the side. It bears less of, less of the weight at push-off. Root said, at toe-off, a person should put 60% of their force under the first metatarsal, the medial forefoot. So our goal would be medial forefoot loading. That when we push off, the majority of our force ends up on the first metatarsal and hallux. Totally in agreement with Root's theory. Last goal. As the first metatarsal phalangeal joint dorsiflexes, you lose range of motion in dorsiflexion at the joint. In other words, can I borrow your first metatarsal phalangeal joint? Have a seat right here. Put out your foot and say, ah. Uh -uh. <laughs> Watch what happens. I push up on his first metatarsal. His toe will not dorsiflex. I lower his first metatarsal, and I get enormous dorsiflexion. This is what we call functional hallux limitus. It's got great range of motion until you stand on it. <laughs> so we'd like a foot that when it's functioning, when you're walking on it, it has no functional hallux limitus. That there's a free range of motion in the first metatarsal phalangeal joint. Thank you. So our four goals were hitting the ground in enough supination to cause a time delay in pronation. Secondly, resupinating by mid-stance to have a propulsive lever. Thirdly, propelling off the medial side of your forefoot. And fourthly, preventing functional hallux limitus. And if we have that, we have a pretty good foot. Let me go over a little history of foot biomechanics. You have to realize that prior to Merton Root, there was only one diagnosis of the foot mechanically. Everybody had weak foot. That was it. There's an 1896 article, and you can look up dozens of articles describing weak foot. Merton Root was an enormous pioneer, and the way his mind worked was very interesting. He was a huge fan of the botanist Linnaeus. Linnaeus was the botanist who first used the structure or morphology of plants to classify them. So what Mert was trying to do was look at the foot and see if he could see morphological differences, structural differences between people, and see how they related to pathology, which is a brilliant idea. And he pioneered foot biomechanics. Prior to him, it didn't exist. I spent some time with Tom Scarlato. And Tom worked with uh, Mert in the early days and wrote the compendium on foot biomechanics. And I said to him, what was so exciting back in the late 60s, early 70s about what Mert was doing? 
And he said, Ed, we turned the patient over. That was really exciting. Nobody had turned the patient on their stomach. And when he turned the patient over, he, not he noticed that most people had a rear foot that was inverted. And he gave us rear foot varus. Then he noticed that people also had a forefoot that was even more inverted. And he gave us forefoot varus. Then he noticed metaductus, the metatarsals going to the inside, a C-shaped foot. And finally, forefoot valgus. And they wrote the book, Normal and Abnormal Function of the Foot. They knew the importance of foot function. But in 1954, Mert Root took his best educated guess as to what the corrected position of the foot should be. And you wouldn't be in this room, or you would fail this course, <laughs> if you didn't know what that position is. What am I talking about? What position did he say to put the foot in? Neutral position, right? Where did it come from? If you read Root, Orion, and Weed, you'll find on page 124 a reference. The reference goes to an article by Dr. Wright written in 1964. And if you pull the article, you'll see it's, he's an orthopod who simply looked at two people standing, one of which was himself in the mirror. But in 1954 is where neutral really came about. And you'll find this in Lee's Clinics in Podiatry, October of 2001. And I quote, I was standing in the shower without any thought about the foot at all, when all of a sudden the concept of subtalar joint neutral flashed into my mind. This is what turned out to be the key to my being able to contribute to podiatry. Merton Root. Now I'm not saying that it's wrong because he came up with it in the shower, that's fine. But what I'm saying is it was not the result of a long series of complex experiments and it has never since been actually validated as the corrected position to put the foot in, which is kind of interesting, and yet it's very universally accepted. Let's take a look at Mert's neutral position theory. The first thing to note is that it revolves around the subtalar joint axis. We all know the subtalar joint axis goes from dorsal anterior medial to plantar posterior lateral. It's the most interesting axis in the foot because it's triplane. It involves all three planes of motion. And because it, in the open chain, you get a pretty considerable amount of motion around the subtalar joint axis. Why do you get so much motion around the subtalar joint axis when you hang your foot out in space? Because there's nothing compressing these two bones together. So when they reach the end of where they would normally stop, they continue to separate. So you get this huge range of motion between the talus and the calcaneus around this axis in the open chain. But in the closed chain, we're not so lucky. The ground doesn't move that far. The ground doesn't move at all, unless you're in California. What happens? The bones have to move in relationship to each other. So it no longer is simply a rotation around a singular axis, as it is in the open chain, but it's multiple axes occurring at 35 different joints in the foot, all working together as the bones move in relationship to each other. When you look at all the axes put together, you don't really have an, a single axial rotation. What you have is a change in posture. The foot actually changes its posture from supinated high arched to pronated low arched. One of the problems that I saw with neutral position was that it was neither precise nor accurate. Precise means that all the points are concentrated in one single area. Accurate means they're in the middle of the target. What do I mean by that? Well, Mike Pernowski did a study and found that experienced foot care practitioners could palpate neutral with an accuracy of plus or minus three degrees. We know that the bisection of the calcaneus can have an error up to five degrees. 